Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Kevin, who is a male-to-female-to-male detransitioner. In this conversation, we talk about his reasons for transitioning and the impact that transition had on his physical and psychological well-being and how he is getting himself on track and radically accepting who and what he is. He's a very wonderful very kind man, and I am deeply honored to host stories such as his, so do check out my Detransitioner series to better understand the impacts that gender ideology and medical transition is having on the lives of real people. Without further ado, here is Kevin. How's your day going? Pretty good. Just uh, stopped doing insurance sales after a few years, and uh, just picked up electrician apprentice oh. uh, gig, and I've uh, been doing that for well ever since I I let you know. <laughs> so like a week ago, or or a week maybe two weeks, I don't know. Yeah. So you're in the trades now. Is there a guild? Are you part of a guild yet? You have to work your way up, right? I'm I'm a registered unlicensed electrician now. Okay. Yeah, but I don't know what the guild is. <laughs> Could be. Have you? Had, are, were you born with a soldering iron in your fist? Definitely a wrench, for sure, and <laughs> you know, a table saw. <laughs> wow! Oh God, poor mama. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. I was always building stuff with my dad, and you know, he was a he's an like electrical engineer. We were always building stuff, and okay. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> So, um, what, what's your academic trajectory then? Yeah, that's from 20, yeah, 2010 to about 2019, 2018. I did a undergrad master's and I did 90% of a doctorate and then uh, I got in a motorcycle accident and then I, uh, they, uh, I tried to get like a medical withdrawal and then they said, you're going to have to, we're going to decline that because, uh, you have, you know, doctoral responsibilities that you need to fulfill. And I said, well, it's not my fault that I got hit by a car. So I'm just going to, you know, withdraw from the semester. Uh, and they said, well, if you want to continue, you'll have to take out a loan to pay us back the stipend that we paid you. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to leave then. <laughs> hmm. You know, and I had, I had issues with uh, my master's too, where like uh, they said, if I didn't go to an Ivy League school, they wouldn't give me a reference. So like okay. they, if I didn't go to Curtis, Rice, Yale, Juilliard or anything like that, they would be like, well, uh, we don't want, we don't want our name on that school. So uh, we're just going to not give you a reference. And that's why I took the gig at ASU because they didn't need the reference because they just, they, I gave them a tape of my playing and they're like, this is, you sound great. Like, let's bring you over. We'll, we'll get, give you a stipend. We'll give you a full ride. And yeah. So this is, this is a doctorate in an instrument or in composition or what? Yeah. In an instrument. Um, but uh, the, the masters were, was really um, like, performance and practicing based it's basically like an artist diploma but with a thesis okay uh artist diploma you just practice a ton and perform a ton and then the doctorate is really preparing you to go and teach at a college or uh conservatory or university what instrument so you just uh bassoon okay <laughs> i've seen whiplash um, was it anything with school, anything like that? Flash. It sounds so familiar. Is that like an old movie? No, it's not that old. It's like three, <laughs> four, probably four or five years old. It's, uh, okay. I can't even remember the actor's name, but it's about a drummer who is put through the ringer with his Oh yeah. I heard professor. about that. Yeah. 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 I, I did quite a bit of drum line and I remember seeing that and I was just the whole time, like seeing the preview, I was just like, 
I don't think I can do it. <laughs> I know too much about drum stuff. <laughs> 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 I know it's, I, I know it's, I'm just, I, I won't enjoy it. I'm sure yeah. it'll make a movie, but <laughs> I just know too much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So why bassoon then? Was that just what you, you were just handed that in seventh grade or in when you were four? Yeah. You know, I, my grandfather would always have like classical records playing and, and uh, I remember Shostakovich nine, there's this massive, huge bassoon solo. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, it's bassoon. And I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard. I want to play that. And that was like fifth when I was like in fifth grade or something like that. And then I learned you can get paid to play. And I was like, Psh, I'm, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. Like, like a studio musician or, or a professional concert musician? Yeah. So professional orchestral musician. Okay. Yeah. 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 And the uh, big reason why I, I've, I've stepped out of that is just everything has become so politicized where, uh, you know, just by me saying, I don't believe that kids should take puberty blockers or hormones, I would definitely get fired. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Or from a university or uh, orchestra. A any, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a moderate, right, politically, but even during COVID, there was... I think 13 or 14 orchestral members just for sharing their, their right sided views. And that's still happening. And that all started during COVID. What I'm sensing is that, okay, well, academia itself is all about reputation more than anything else is about reputation management with regard yeah. to sitting around playing centuries old pieces of music for a very mm -hmm. elite audience it is highly mm -hmm. highly highly about reputation reputation management <laughs> this is, is, is this is the sense i'm getting and yeah. to even write I, I i suppose if they ever even play anything new uh it's all it's usually about reputation not about the quality of the work it's all nepotistic but or ideotistic yep. uh, not nepotistic but ideo nepotism kind of stuff it's all about the right way yeah, of thinking, true. right? Yeah, it's very much about, yeah, you got it right on the nose. I mean, it's to, to a degree where, you know, even if someone's written something just outstanding, uh, if they don't have a good light within the community, uh, or like, or, it, it, uh, God forbid, if they don't have a degree to back it, hmm. um, then it's even harder. Um, there's only one guy that I know that uh, made it to like a professional orchestra, uh, performing wise, without a without a degree, and he's very proud to also be a pig farmer, which is just badass. <laughs> oh, really, French horn and Chicago symphony. Yeah, he's still playing. He's just phenomenal. Wow. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Odd extremely odd yeah i love that character though but yeah it's very much about reputation for sure yeah especially in the in in the u.s yeah well that, that's the way that the um system selects for um uh, i guess that's it's one way of uh enforcing some sort of barrier to entry into something that is probably highly sought after but very low demand so a lot of supply, very low demand. So, you know, how else are they going to filter it through? And this woke stuff, if you would pardon the term, is one way to just control, <laughs> uh, and just kind of trim the fat. That's a really interesting perspective. I think it's a really fair statement because, you know, when I, when I was a, a trans woman, like it's, it, it was remarkable um, just how, like, it was almost like I was like sought after within the either the like the orchestra space or uh, the college space, hmm. you know, and it was 
you know, you know, they talk about male privilege. It's just like I, I think there's trans privilege because <laughs> I, you know, it's I when that went away, I was like, man, I have to I feel like I need to work harder now yeah. <laughs> in some so- social spaces. Yeah. Which I'm not a part of anymore because, you know, now that I've shared my views, I'm, you know, nothing less of a Nazi, of course. You're just an electrician. Yeah, I'm just an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> what what does it feel like? To, what does it feel like to say when I was a trans woman? Oh God, I fucking hate it. <laughs> it's it's it is uh it's like I got caught in a net that lasted 10 years, 10 years. It's, it's all well, nine years, but, um, you know, I, there's, when I, when I stopped taking estrogen and getting back on tea, I, I felt compelled to, uh, listen to cult survivors and just seeing where, where they were at, you know, mentally and spiritually and man the overlaps are wild (laughs) it's it's just you know completely just you know i don't know 80 90 percent of how they how they came over it uh, it was just like wow that's that's about where i was at too that's that's nuts you know like with all the the fear and the shame that you had to get over just the fact that you that you were wrong to get to that point and then you know because it's you know getting to that point there's this you know massive high coming out and it's you know over celebrated and you know uh, you know and it's the coming out of it it's like you're like that's a massive vacuum of space of that you need to move through and no yeah very very massive because not only are you losing the so-called trans community or the um you know the rainbow coalition that whole movement the whole ideology all those people all those strangers essentially strangers that celebrated you uh, that maybe used you for clout <laughs> yeah. and, and gave you attention in return. Uh, but you would ask your family to believe in this thing. And and to whether degree they believed or disbelieved, you were even drawn closer or further away from them. And then to switch again, you know, <laughs> and say, listen, I was wrong or I'm sorry. You know, like, like the, it's so humbling. It's got to be so humbling. I had one extremely good year with insurance and i got done my house like i want to take some time off and working insurance um, just to you know, audience clarity so i took some time off and uh i was like you know i what what, what else should i do i you know i i'm not like i want to if i'm going to travel i want to have you know an intention to do it i don't want to just go and just you know you know do nothing <laughs> So uh, I found a, like an ayahuasca retreat in Peru, and uh, I was like, you know, you know, let's do it. And th- like at this point, I was, you know, still didn't uh, quite detransition. I was still on the other side, right? And you know, I went down there, and uh, there was like a month of prep with the facilitators, and the the first night, even the, without any of that plant medicine there was uh, where you go sit in front of the the main uh maestro or my uh maestro of the the person that's going to be uh leading the ceremony and um everything just came out right right there i was just like i think i made a mistake i was like bawling i and like the facilitators were like where is this coming from we don't like you didn't talk about this before i was like I don't know where it came from. And this was it before even doing anything. And that's really where the journey started. And the the following two weeks of being in that village doing plant medicine was even more revealing. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it's, um, I, I forget what you said that brought me to say that, but yeah. So 
<laughs> why why be a woman? So um you know, I had uh quite a bit of not quite a bit. Um apparently had just enough uh child trauma where I was um where I had this internal instinct to uh, demonize my masculine side um, and to be ashamed of it and to hide it and to not embrace it and to love that part of me. And, you know, that didn't really manifest in any specific way. You know, I, up until uh, age 20 or 21 or 22, I forget the exact age, I started estrogen, I think it was 21. Everything was pretty much normal at that point. But uh, there's a, a trans man named uh, uh, Lauren Cameron that came to my school and did a presentation that uh, he goes and has a whole presentation of himself and probably about 20 or 50 uh, trans people that are just completely posted naked and he just flips through these photos telling each person's story trying to normalize those bodies and my unhealed self took that opportunity and said this is a way where i can even further dedicate to a shaming and covering up my masculine is by taking the same route that these people did and that's of course that's not where i yeah, where i was mentally yeah. but that's you know that's the you know you could call it the ego the sh you know whatever you want to call it there was a a deep sense within myself that wanted to grab onto any mask that would help uh just cover the masculine um i and you know, even after that, anytime I'd look in the mirror, I'd be like, man, I wish I wouldn't look like this, you know, and, it, and it, it all stemmed from getting that idea. And so, and that was like sophomore year in college. And I think it was uh, senior year. Yeah, senior year is when I started estrogen. Hmm. Uh, and so that, uh, it was late senior year. So I, and then I probably did... I don't know, therapy for, I think, three months before that. What, so, yeah. What, so what was woman beside a mask of the masculine? Like, what did you think about girls? What was your relationship with, with women? Right. Um, I was interpreting my attraction to them as me wanting to be them. Huh. And after I got the idea to transition, I did all kinds of mental gymnastics to rationalize that. Uh, and so it's an <laughs> autogynophilia via confusion of some sort. So you're attracted to woman, but uh, you confuse the attraction to women as a desire to be, or the pathway or the push to become them rather than becoming them themselves being the yeah. pinnacle of your desire for them. Uh, that in which was also triggered by unhealed trauma yeah. for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Cause I, I don't, I definitely don't have that now. <laughs> okay. But yeah, absolutely at that time, mm -hmm. for sure. What what kind of preparation did you have to do to initiate the transition? You said something about therapy, but just getting yourself ready, selecting the name, thinking, thinking about yep. coming out. Like, Did you start going to uh, these rainbow centers on campus and stuff like that? That's exactly where I went. Okay. Oh, Cause they had the answers. <laughs> uh, like what, what, what would they, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what did they have that you were seeking or what did you think they had? So 
Well, the yeah, the Rainbow Center, uh, you know, provided the information for the Lauren Cameron event, and that's what really started that. Um, they also uh, provided um, pay of admission, transportation, and lodging for. Uh, it was something called Mumble Tech, uh, Midwest uh, Gay, Lesbian, Trans, Ally College Conference. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I got that right. It's probably one of them. One of the letters is wrong. Uh, and that's where they would, uh, you know, just woke the crap out of uh, everyone that attended um, as far as uh, educating, educating what the new age of what what basically is going on um that's that was i i think that's really what kind of sparked it because the first year i went you know there's maybe like five thousand then there's twenty thousand and it just kept almost quadrupling each year for the attendance of that kind of conference hmm. um so they supplied that um they also let me know that you know they'll They'll give me money to change my name. They'll give me money to. I think I think that was the big one. I think yeah, they gave me like five hundred dollars to do all their forms and the college or the uh, the court date. Are who are they funded by? But, like the Human Rights Campaign or something? This is a lot of money. It seems like that they're handing out. It's like Scientology up in our school system or something. <laughs> it's really that's a lot of money. Right. They're just gratis. Will sterilize you. And yeah, it was. I mean, I think between the funding of because it was uh, it was like a there there was um, I don't even know what her official position was but she was like the qasu or the the queer i guess uh professor but not really a, even she wasn't even a professor she was like a like a guidance counselor but and so she had this position and i think the college gave her funding that they used to do all the things I mean, there were some donations too, but hmm. I think the college just gave them a good amount of money because they kept getting awards of the most queer friendly college of the year or something like that. So most my parents trans really have just students taken in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> what, what were you saying about your parents? Oh, I was saying that's, you know, when they, when uh, the article for, uh, most queer friendly college in the Midwest or the U S or something. I was like, that's when my parents really should have pulled me oh, yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about your social life during this time in college? Are you getting along with people or yeah. your sense of alienation yeah. that preceded this or facilitated the transition? No, no, not at all. That was probably the, the the heights of my social life really i mean because there, there was just so many different clubs and because like i was so many different var uh, various clubs of like music activities that i was doing and as that progressed through degrees that the, the things i was involved with was less and less because it was what i was doing was more and more specialized so it was more yeah. isolated yeah. Uh, um but Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it, I mean, even for how I came out, uh, I know it spooked a lot of people <laughs> because at first they were doing an article for me because uh, I was like the first bassoon performance major at that college. And so they were, they were doing that. And that was uh, when I was getting interviewed for that, the... It was like a month after I started uh, estrogen. And so after they did the interview, uh, I called the, um, uh, what do you call him? The editor, uh, the writer back. And I was like, this is also going on. Do you want to add that in? And she said, yes. And so we ended up having 
that as an addition to the article and then i just use that as a way to come out <laughs> okay and so uh yeah when that came out that was pretty much on day or two before graduation or on graduation and um yeah i didn't i i i, I emailed my my parents and my family i was like hey if you're coming to my graduation by the way this is happening because okay. <laughs> they had no idea Yeah, but I mean, otherwise, friend friend group was, you know, supportive, beyond supportive, and on board, and everything like that. Growing up in your culture and your time, was there any s changing sex? wasn't Was it not that big of a deal? I guess. Unheard of. Okay, so it's, it's unheard of. But how did? How does your origin, your people of origin, react to that? Was that like, <laughs> was that a ah, uh, like my? Are you talking your family, like my your, friend group, yeah, your friend group, or, or, oh, back home? You know, sure. you come back, you're like ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The family, they did not take that well. <laughs> you know, there was like two at least. Uh, you know, the the family it was like two or three years of loud arguments and um mm. after a while it just kind of got to the point where it was just tolerant love and uh, a couple years after that was it seemed like it really kind of just became peak love tolerance like it like it was really masked to the point where i thought it was genuine but it was actually just tolerance mm. Which I'm not saying is bad. I, you know, it's it's who they are, and uh, uh, you know, they, you know, they have every right, and they're entitled to how they think or feel as an individual. What were they trying to tell you if you think back on those arguments? Oh, to not do it, <laughs> for sure. Why? Yeah, I was making a mistake. Yeah. Okay. Because the because it's not natural. Okay, it's not natural. <laughs> it, it, the damage involved in your bodies were they all that well versed in the yeah the, that as well. Um, you know, risk for suicide. Yeah, all the things. Had you been Absolutely. suicidal at all before transitioning? No. No. Okay. Did you go through like even a mopey I, or a Depeche Mode phrase uh, phase, a goth phase? Did you ever adopt the darkness? No, I just. A, no, I just practiced it. I just played a shit ton of bassoon. Okay. I was just, huh. you know, I was just obsessed with bassoon. I was practicing, you know, four to six hours every day from middle school till doctor. Okay. Every day. Yeah. Do, do you, <laughs> there is a prevalence of autistic trait endowed people transitioning? Did you, ha do you, do you, looking back at your developmental arc, you, do you see any of that, like, uh, strong urge to categorize things or, like, kind of like a, a, a difficulty connecting with people beyond, like, some sort of pattern recognition? I don't think so. Okay. I, it, it, you know, it, it seems attractive to, to try to label it as that, yeah. but... You know, because I mean, I was diagnosed with ADHD and a uh, auditory processing disorder and a learning disability by second grade. Okay. Just because I was a hyper, I was a hyper kid. I didn't want to pay attention. Auditory you know? pre uh, was... processing disorder. So you just didn't pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. When they were telling me that, I was just like, "This is dumb." But okay. well, I mean, no, this is this is a really important point because they're already labeling you with all of these medical terminology. So the transition yeah. stuff is just another terminology that you get to identify into, and then has room for you to explore yourself, develop yourself. That's that's true. I suppose I I don't know. I really fought it because um, they tried to giving me Ritalin and. I remember telling him it made me feel like a zombie hmm. and uh, they still tried to make me take it. And so I, I'd, I'd always spit it out. <laughs> uh, and so it got to the point where, you know, I put it under my tongue and like, I pretended to like swallow it. 
And, yeah. you know, like when I leave for the bus, I'd spit it out outside. <laughs> you know, like I just, I really, I, I just, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't buy into it at all. And, uh, I, I just, the, uh, it makes sense for me to, for why I put myself in the practice room or in, in practice mode so much is just cause I, because I, I didn't know how to properly educate myself in a way that would give me efficient and effective knowledge to be who I wanted to be. And I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know how that felt like. I didn't know how it would sound either. Um, mm-hmm. I just knew what I was, what was in front of me and what I was hearing just was not what I wanted to hear and was not aligning what I wanted to do. And so I was just like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, shoot a rubber band at the teacher and get, you know, suspended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Going back to the bassooning, is there a ver- is there a better verb yeah. for the act of playing? I love that. I love that verb. To, to yeah, bassooning is okay. fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what path of self-actualization did that provide what, what was the feeling of performing the feeling of practicing the the feeling of being at one with the bassoon or filling up the room with these <laughs> notes was that mm. what did that give you mm. I th- there's a couple different takes that i've sort of plugged into this um one of them is um, as a coping mechanism for the trauma that happened because after the, after the trauma, the, the, the desire to practice a lot happened after, okay. or at least a short span after could be that. I don't know for certain, but it was, it's also just like the only thing I could do with out being a ballistically energetic mess of a little kid. (laughs) It was the only thing like, I didn't like, like I, (laughs) I didn't read a book till college. Like I, to the degree. Yeah. Like it was, it was, I I'll never forget in my high school English class. I was so bad at like plagiarizing. I remember uh, we had to go and write a speech, right? I don't even remember what it was supposed to be like, supposed to be about, but I remember copying and pasting George Bush's some George Bush speech and like just copying it word for word, like just select all and just copy and paste, and that was my paper. <laughs> and uh, he and he, I think he like gave me a C on it or something like that. And the funniest part though was that I had to read it out loud in front of the class. And I did that. <laughs> and, you know, like, I didn't, you know, I, I thought I did a good job. And I thought I would have gotten away with it. And I, like, later on, um, that teacher asked me, he's like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, or what do you want to do, like, after high school or something? I was like, I, you know, I want to go play in orchestras. I want to I wanna go do this. And he's like, well, like, are you, like, practicing a lot or whatever? I was like, you can come down to the practice rooms. I, I'm there, you know, all the time. He's like, if I pass you, you promise you'll go pursue pursue. Hmm. I was like, okay. <laughs> so here's the reason why I, I'm not a very good writer. <laughs> oh, okay. hmm. But um, yeah, it, it's uh, it was always like my my get out of jail free card, you know. Uh, I got out of taking algebra two because of it, you know, like, you know, there, there are so many different things I was able to get out of because, hmm. you know, I simply play the bassoon yeah. halfway decent. One wonders, well, the question being to what degree did transing oneself become a get out of jail hmm. card intentionally, <laughs> unintentionally in, in retrospect. Yeah. Oh man. Like what, what would, what would just hypothetically a, or personally, what would being a trans yeah. woman, uh, get you, uh, save you from having to deal with myself. 
it was a, it was it was the perfect mask from myself you know because i i didn't understand what it what it meant to you know to em, 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 embrace masculinity and embrace myself i didn't know what that looked like you know i i had no idea and you know kind of like i was saying before but you know the you, you could call it the ego but the that part of me or the ego whatever you want to call it like just i i remember describing after lauren cameron's presentation i was like a, a little schoolgirl being so excited about something so what that tells me is it was so eager to attach onto something that I could completely disassociate for myself and create another persona, you know, and I don't, I, I don't buy into the fact that, you know, you, you could label that as, you know, uh, multiple personality disorder or, you know, I, 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 it's just severely, I just needed to figure out my, my trauma and just simply develop on my own. Apologize are all apologies. Uh, you, you speak about masculinity, you speak about trauma. Mm -hmm. If, if you're a woman, then you don't have to have an erection. If you're a woman, you don't have to have a male desire to possess, to penetrate. Um, to, if, if you're mm -hmm. a woman, you, you don't have to deal with that. You can, be the receiver, I guess. Is that, is that part of it? Like dealing with the male sexual urge, that <clears throat> intensity of focus, that being in a body that not. Yeah. I, I see where you're going. Compels so it, it probably shed some light on what the trauma was. So I was molested and around fifth or sixth grade or so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after healing that and understanding my response to it at the time, at that age, you know, so 10, I don't know, like 10 year old, 10 year old Kevin or something like that ish, you know, putting, putting my, my shoes, my 10 year old Kevin shoes back on and really going back to that point and really understanding how I responded and what that felt like at that time. And what my relationship to that now is, and how that manifested to getting to transing that looked like just completely being afraid to hurt anybody. I thought if I did this, there would be no way I could hurt somebody else. You know, I didn't think that, but the ego or, you know, whatever that, that part of me, that's what that latched onto. And there, there's absolutely no doubt uh, I was just deathly afraid of hurting somebody else. Like I didn't, I didn't think I would, but the, the, that, that just instilled so much fear of there's a possible capability of doing that to somebody else. This is, this is a very important point and not a lot of men have spoken to this. Um, but in the stories of the detransitioners, um, there's a prevalence of uh, among the females of being sexually uh, harassed in some way or molested in some way and wanting mm. to move away from being the object of desire. Mm. There's also, mm. and there's murmurs of it in the detransitioned male stories of wanting to move away from the objectifier, wanting to move away. And, and it's, it's under, right. it's under understood. It's under voiced. But the, the, yeah. it's kind of, in, at least in the feminist discourse, it's more developed that women do not like being in the role of sexualized, ogled, groped, wanted in that way before they're ready to. And even after they're ready to, mm -hmm. they just, there's, some, there's a lot of discourse that, that discusses that. But it's sure, counter sure. to our culture, and I think it's very counter <laughs> to our biology to... Absolutely. Ask or to uh, to speak about the male's wish to not become the conqueror, to not become the uh, especially the assaulter, and and if a boy, especially mm -hmm. a sensitive boy, um, an artistic boy, um, 
uh, is, encounters through his body, a male body, like taking over control of him and hurting him, then there, there, it's, it's very, it, why wouldn't he want to disassociate himself from the male body that, that allows for this violation to occur totally. and then to associate violation with the active penetration of sexuality, the whole thing. And then, and then there you go. Here we go. Um, just trans yourself. You, you are a woman. Did you ever, did you ever adopt the, the thought? Like I am a woman. I'm I, like inside of myself. Is there a woman? Like, how did no. you, okay. How did you, how did you, <laughs> how did you build the narrative of around transition to, you know, bolster up you going through this rigorous and devoted process of, physical mm -hmm. transformation just so i don't go on a wrong tangent you're asked can, can you can you rephrase that question or just say that again well some you know there's uh i i'm i'm a i'm a female in male's body you know like my 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 internal sense How of did self I yeah well that? yeah so that's the that's a common narrative that facilitates or sure. bolsters this very rigorous mm -hmm. process of physically transitioning yourself there has to be a narrative so if you don't have that narrative mm -hmm. if i'm really a woman i'm actually a woman what was the narrative that you right. that you built up to talk yourself through yeah. the whole thing or and and then to communicate it to other people make it make sense to other people <laughs> yeah yeah i never well i guess i'll start with pronouns because that's a that's a fun one hmm. the uh, anytime I was mispronounced, like I've always laughed, like, and I, not in a sense that like, I was like laughing cause I was hurting. Like, you know, I just, because I mean, almost maybe three to four months in, like it was extremely rare that I got mispronounced because I just, I passed so well, so, um, so early. And so whenever, you know, whenever it didn't happen, I was like, oh, you got it wrong. You know, like it was, it was like a fun, like a funny thing I'd, I'd like laugh about, like probably for throughout the rest of the day. Like even, I remember during a rehearsal, my director uh, called me Kevin in front of everyone. And everyone didn't even know that I was, I, I wasn't, that I was trans, like, and so, like, that's why, like, I didn't care because, like, you know, I wasn't Kevin at that point, you know? Hmm. And so when it happened, I was just like, <laughs> you know? So uh, to kind of explain myself and how I got to that point is um, I've just never really given a fuck about what other people think or feel about those possibilities that may be about me. You know, I, I just, I, I, this never mattered to me. It's always, it's always been extremely frivolous to even entertain the idea that other people's possible thoughts, feelings, or perceptions about me have any remote matter with, with, for me. Like, I, I, um, am I sensitive to them? Absolutely. Uh, to a degree where it took a long time to, you know, figure out my relationship with that. But, you know, I, I, and I think where that a lot of that stems from is, you know, my parents they they took me to, uh, me and the family over to like India, and Malaysia, and Bangladesh when I was like also in second grade, um, and you know, and I just got to the point where I was just like, I don't like every living thing is so beautiful. So like, why would I get to the point where, uh. I, 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 I just see things as a very bigger picture since that point, I guess. Um, and I, I just, I, I've never seen myself as more or less than other people. And I think that's really equated to just, you know, I, I never really considered myself, uh, uh, how was it back then? Because I, I know more of probably the, the second half of of when I was trans. I was I was very 
cognitively aware that I was just a man that was taking estrogen, you know, and I, I very, that, that there was a shift. But I think the first half or so rough estimate of the first half may have been, you know, I have this thing that I'm working towards. And once I'm done doing this, something may or may not happen. What would that be? Like a, a great uh, discovery of yourself? Like a final, like, apotheosis? You become some sort of, like, eternal creature? I, yeah, I'm, I'm using big you know, words, <laughs> right. but, like, like, what are you imagining? Like, you're going to... What was the summit? Like a one. Um, I, I, I knew it was never going to be a real woman. But I... I, I, the amount of mental gymnastics and, and lying to myself, like I, uh, with, with this line of questioning, I still, uh, it still boggles my mind and how I even <laughs> like made those choices. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, it, it's a really, really special thing that the ego does where it gets to the point where um, you know, you think you're the one of something or like, you, uh, you, you know, you kind of become like this, uh, like, um, take on like a God persona, like you're, you're, you're special, you're more than everything else. And that all got bottled up with the transness, you know, uh, you know, like, oh, well, you know, if I do this then something magical will happen or uh, this magical feeling will happen, um, <laughs> trans euphoria then. Probably. Transubstantiation, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh that that just latched on like a a parasite and just grew for sure. Let me let my um, little kitty yeah. cat out. He woke up, now he wants to go do it pee or something. Doesn't want to hear about me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he can't even hear about you. He's just <laughs> hearing me no, nodding <laughs> Um so was there was there like a like when when you think of what you were thinking about being trans like was there like s some sort of self actualization like and do you mind if we know your uh, your trans name just oh yeah <laughs> you gonna dead name me no I'm just kidding uh, undead <laughs> name you isn't it undead if you're a detransitioner then you uh, yeah undead yeah we're bringing back the the dead I suppose uh, or undead I don't know Evelyn Evelyn. Kevin, mm -hmm. Evelyn. So was Evelyn, did Evelyn, mm -hmm. and we don't have to get like poetic or spooky, uh, dissociative identity disorder, <laughs> but, but in Evelyn start like achieving Evelyn, like, was she like mm -hmm. some sort of goddess? Was she beyond hurt and suffering or was she well, like, was she a different person? Was she was, uh, you know, conceptualizing Evelyn and becoming mm -hmm. Evelyn a way of you know, like, it's like some sort of like huge book pro it's like your Ulysses, you know, like everybody's going to write the great American <laughs> novel. Yours just happens to be becoming a woman. Was, was that like, was it a pursuit in a way? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, at the time, you know, I was just like, Oh, there's, there's, this is so much adversity I have to go through. It must, this must mean this, this is going to make me uh, a much more like potent uh, performer and composer and and teacher. Okay. Yeah, because hmm. the it I had named myself after someone within a really famous orchestra. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And was it kind of a cul-de-sac for? Um, to what degree was it a cul-de-sac for your energies? Like, uh, in some theological circles, our existence is to serve existence not to be the center of existence was mm -hmm. evelyn in a way with escaping your obligations to the world and existence or a way of fulfilling your your destiny mm -hmm. in a sense i feel like i was doing that with bassoon okay quite a bit. yeah all right then did Evelyn get in the yeah. way of Bassoon or did Bassoon get in the way of Evelyn? Yes. Uh, uh, Evelyn got in the way of Bassoon mm. for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Massively. 
yeah, I mean, I've been on been off estrogen and back on T uh, for about maybe three, maybe four months now. And playing now is like I was back in my 20s. Like it's, or, or I guess late teens. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just it, the, the feeling, the passion, the love, the creativity. Wow. It's it's all back. Wow. So, so that estrogen then uh, dumbed you or dulled you? I think probably within a month of on estrogen, I had my uh, first interaction with like suicidal ideation and um, like even like a suicidal attempts. And uh, when I brought that up with my doctor, they were like, well, you know, uh, we just need to make sure your levels are good and you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> That's I, I kid you not. Cause they, at first it like I shot up, I was like, pregnant lady or double pregnant lady levels or something like that. And, you know, I, I couldn't handle it. Uh, but they were just like, no, no, just wait it out. And then when I moved to, to Canada, the, I had to take a different type of estrogen because, you know, over the border, there's, you know, different brands and, you know, different ways of using that type of medication. The, le the levels there took probably six to eight months to level up there. So like pretty much, pretty much the first year of my master's was hormonal mess. <laughs> and then uh, the second half, the, my body started rejecting them to the, the degree where my levels started dropping. So we couldn't get them at a, like a normal level. So then I was again, a hormonal mess. And then after we got them stable, I then had surgery. And then I went and did uh, started a doctorate, which then at that location had a di another different form of of estrogen, and I went through three different types there. And I was also a complete hormonal mess there. I was hospitalized twice for uh, suicidal ideation, uh, you know. And so coming out of it, I've realized that I basically. By detransitioning, I won chronic depression as well. You won it. I I defeated it. I you know I I, I got out of it. <sighs> Jeez, yeah, please. because because it you know it, it I I basically had to compensate for whatever even when i was at good levels you know i still had issues right you know i was told like this is this is normal this is fine um and uh i you know i went to therapy it got it was okay for the last um uh, maybe maybe three to four years maybe maybe five years the second half um yeah, that that first that first five years, man, first five six years. And you just oh, you just put your head down. You just powered through it. Yeah, yeah, I just did school. Okay. Yeah, I did masters and doctorate during it. Yeah. What was your relationship to this thing called surgery that you kind of hinted at? I actually I recently had a consultation with a lawyer on it because I was not sound of mind when I made that decision. And there's medical documents stating of what I was currently going through at the time that I made the decision, uh, which I have copies of. And, uh, you know, so uh, when I was during, during my master's uh, in, in Vancouver, it's legal to smoke weed, right? So we're around, we're smoking weed, having a good time at the end of the day. And uh, there was this one guy that I was with that, I normally wasn't there, but he was there. And he uh, just so happened to uh, not just smoke weed, but he also smoked crack. All right. And, you know, I didn't know that because it looked like a normal one-y that you would have for, for weed at the time. And, you know, this was back in 20... 
2015, 2016. Um, so he, you know, he thought you know, the rest of the group wanted some of what he was having. And so I was right next to him. And he, he loads that up, passes it to me. I hit that. And I go on like a two and a half month bender while I'm doing my master's. And I, my monkey brain just was like, I got to have more. Yep. I got to have more. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, I know uh, what you're I, talking you about. Know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I never had with any issue with, well, I shouldn't say any issue with addiction, but um, not to the degree where it severely affected my life to that degree. Uh, I probably lost 40 pounds. Um, I wouldn't sleep for three days and I'd sleep for like, you know, 20 hours or something like that. And, um, right in the middle of that is when I decided to sign up to be on the list to have surgery. Why? And I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, I remember, um, you know, I remember going to grad school up there. Um, I liked the idea that being up there meant getting free surgery um, because students get their um, health care. Um, but when I first got there, I was just like, you know what? I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And I, I told them, I told them no. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I have no good answer <laughs> for why, why I chose to do it because I, um, to, to give you um, a way to understand on how out of my mind I was, when I was recovering from surgery, the level of how much the pain medications was not working is, no, uh, excuse me. So when I woke up from surgery, excuse me, I, I woke up screaming, like bloody murder. And I had two nurses coming in and out of the room, sticking me with a uh, painkiller and nothing worked because my body was completely trashed. And so uh, no matter what I took, no matter what they stick me with, like nothing worked for pain medication. And so I went throughout the entire uh, healing process of that without any pain medication. Um, is this, uh, is this just, uh, subtractive or, uh, did you get some construction done? I'm trying to be political here, but, <laughs> uh, so that, that experience was the vaginal plasty. So you were, you lost your testicles and then they, uh, constructed a, uh, neo vagina yep. for you. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. <laughs> yep. When did you yeah. realize what had happened and how did you uh, take that? What was your relationship to Evelyn's V? Maybe I can put it that way. <laughs> I mean, right away, the only thing I was focused on was... Um, because I didn't, I didn't start having cravings till after surgery. Cravings, um, for for the, the dope. Oh yeah. And um, uh, so it was about a month because you're pretty much bedridden for like the first month. Like you, you mean know, you're you're you know, yeah, you you pretty much just get up to go to the bathroom. So after that, uh, you're able to like, you know, drive and, you know, be a, be an adult again. Um, and I remember going to the grocery store and getting some groceries. And I remember being in the parking lot, going back to my car and I completely collapsed and my entire body was, that was my first massive craving where that's all I could think about. Um, and you know, I, it was like a very, it was, it was like I fainted and then I was able to get up right away. It was like, but yeah, from from that point when that first craving hit so hit so intensely, um, they didn't go away. 
And so while I was healing, um, I had to go and do, I, I didn't want to like get a sponsor. I didn't want to like tell anyone what was going on. So I just like, you know, I, I just Googled like, how do people get off that? <laughs> uh, and I went and did acupuncture. Acupuncture was free at that time in, in, in Canada because it's, uh, it's whatever their healthcare system is. Uh, so I, I did that every day uh, for two or three weeks before I had, or maybe a month before I uh, departed Canada. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've been a big meditator since I was uh, in middle school and, you know, so I would, I would just, you know, get my acupuncture and just fucking <laughs> zen out and just really focus on healing. And, and so it, it really, it really didn't even process what happened. I don't know, probably years later. Um, like I, I was so disassociated with like from myself that like, it just, I, I was just doing everything I could to keep away from myself. Hmm. But at the time, the narrative was, this is amazing. This saved my life. Um, and everything like that. But I'll also never forget um, my last meditation when I was on the, the beach in Canada, um, Vancouver. Um, I remember a very loud voice was, you made a massive mistake and one day you're going to detransition. And I remember just thinking, well, I'm not ready for that right now, but thank you, voice. <laughs> and um, But that, that that never went away. That that memory of, of that feeling and that... Um, that that moment that never faded. That is, um, I I can I can tap into that as if it was yesterday, without trying, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I'd say, uh, as the most more recent years, the relationship to it is just, uh, I think denying reality quite a bit because um, to that point, you know, I thought everything was normal up until Peru. And after Peru, I started having body dysphoria, but for, you know, <laughs> being what I am, <laughs> male, <laughs> you know, hmm. and, um, you know, and so when it, when it got to that point, I was just like, well, it's time to find um, an objective therapist, and hmm. yeah, so I just I did therapy for a solid year, and here I am three months later after that. What What was the th the arc of therapy like? What was the? Um, I guess you have to let go of this trans identity. And yeah. then f yeah. face what's behind it. Like that's so much to process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, yeah. I mean, I, you know, and I mean, the cherry on the top was when I got back from uh, Peru, there was uh, a six month period, the, the, the first six months that I got back, um, I learned that when I first got back, you know, I got my prescription for estrogen and it looked like it was a different brand of estrogen. Um, and, but the, um, the dosage was the same. So I didn't question that. Um, I learned six months later that the potency of it was four times stronger. So the first six months of me integrating the healing of Peru, I was blasted off, you know, pregnant lady levels once again. And I got to the point where the, the end of those two months where I was going insane again, <laughs> as, as one does, you know, cause you're just, 
completely blasted off from estrogen and you know i've been i've been sober since 2016 so i mean i know it's nothing else that i'm doing you know i i work out i eat healthy like i do all the good things i'm, I'm gonna go to adult <laughs> and um I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand what else I'm doing wrong. Like I have, I, I have no idea. Like I am deteriorating and like, this is, I'm at a point where things should be ascending to greater things. And I'm still at a point where I am just not only stuck, but just completely degrading hmm. mentally. So I was just like, you know what, maybe. So I started like asking around like other like powerlifting women that take testosterone. And I'm like, what's your relationship with that? And so like, I was doing everything I could to just stay um, as Evelyn because like, I, I just did not want to go through the process to, to detransition. Uh, as much as I wanted to, I, I didn't want to <laughs> because like, it's, you know, uh, it's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. And so, um, how it started was, you know, I went to the doctor. I said, hey, like, I think this is going on. I think I want to just, you know, maybe take a little testosterone to maybe, like, help ground me because I feel like I'm in space right now. <laughs> and she's like, well, let's check out your levels. And we checked out the levels, and they were, like, just sky high. And I, yeah, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't, um, after all of the, like, the spiritual and emotional energy to process Peru and really understand of like where I was uh, like in relationship to detransitioning or like possibly detransitioning. I just, I just broke down. Like it, it was it, because, you know, trying to hold space for myself when you are so hormonally out of whack um it takes a lot of energy, right? And when when you find out that you've been working through it like so intently and and so with with like the most positive good intention that it, it wasn't even you at, at, at the whole time. It was just like fuck this. I'm like I want to go on tea and let's start this. And so. Um, I think after the first week of the tiny bit of tea, I I felt better than I have since I was like twenty, hmm. and that was like I wasn't even it wasn't even like a resembling of like a level like, but I I I just I that was the best that I ever felt, hmm. um, and uh, um, it took uh, um, I I, th I feel like my doc probably took a little bit longer than we should have, but we took. I think almost two months just to get me up to a good level. Um, that was probably for the best, I guess, but um, like the passion for playing again is back. Um, my relationship to humor is back and I can conceptualize it and understand it. I'm not like socially awkward anymore. Uh, it's not that like I was before, but I had to really think about being social. Like I, I my interactions with people, like, you know, it, it, it was an act, you know, like before one of the first things I said was like, I don't have to act anymore. I don't have to pretend. Um, and so I had to like, you know, process that and yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what are you, what's the goal now without that transition? Is there a detransition goal or are you, just letting that happen and focusing on other things. Well, I did also have implants put in about two years ago. Maybe. Yeah, I think it was about two. So I, I'm a uh, six weeks out um, post-op of that. Uh, the, the, so those are out. D what was it called? D plants. You ye yes, did the yes, teats. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. How, how's your relationship to your how's your relationship to your body it, it i'd say it's a solid 50 50 of it's a battle and i feel fucking amazing hmm. 
because I, I, I'm like, you know, I, I know I don't have a 360 mask around me all the time anymore. Like, I, I just, I just feel like a melted puddle. I just, I'm just, ah, <laughs> you know, because, um, you know, I'm not rigorously holding that up anymore. Because there, there was so much mental energy just holding that up for no reason. So yeah, yeah, I, it's it's pretty awesome. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I've been uh, a pretty active like weightlifter, pretty much for like probably like eleven years now, and in relationship with the gym is, you know, of course better now. <laughs> what helps you, what helps you when you're in the struggle part of this? I'd say the biggest first few things would just be the tools that I learned from my facilitators, um, from Peru, um, having a relationship with my dreams and, um, I know this is a little off track, but the, you know, I mean, we, we spend so much time sleeping and dreaming. And um, when we, when you fall asleep and when you dream, the same chemical goes off in your brain as when you take ayahuasca. And so uh, um, the facilitators that I had, um, their plan of action or intention with helping other people navigate that medicine is to having a relationship and establishing a relationship with your dreams. And what that looks like is before you fall asleep, you say, I'm going to remember my dreams and just simply make a voice memo or write them down. And, you know, if you want to try to understand them, great. If you don't want to understand them or try to you know, figure out the archetypes within them or, you know, if there's something, some meaning behind it, um, you know, go for it, you know, but it's a, for me, it's been such a really great grounding tool instead of just getting up out of, out of the bed in the morning and just going straight to work. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing that now for uh, almost a little over a year now. Yeah. Cause it was, yeah. A little over a year and um adding that to my meditation practice has just been life-changing um absolutely life-changing um i'd say also after detransitioning um and learning who my real inner circle is and you know being vulnerable with them and seeing how they react to that and seeing how open they are to unconditionally loving and supporting throughout that. It's been monumental of just having their support, having that love, having that acceptance, you know, self affirmations and, you know, being, being grateful for things I, I think are helpful. Um, for me, it's, for me, my relationship with that is I, you know, I, I did it for, multiple different segments of time. And for me, I'm so direct and so honest where it's just like, I see that and I appreciate it, the possibility of how that helps other people. For me, I see that as fluff. I haven't given up on it, but I, I, I just, it's hard for me to not think this is silly because <laughs> yeah. I've just gone through so much and I have worked through so much without that. It's just like, do I really do this though? I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you, why are you alive? <laughs> no idea. I should not be. Mm. <laughs> um, no, no, I, um, I really, I, I, uh, you know, one of my, one of my suicide attempts was, uh, jumping from a tree with a noose on my neck. Okay. You know, like I, I shouldn't be straight up. Um, so it's, um, I, you, you you could call it a, a higher power. You could call it a guardian angel. You could call it 
destiny. I have no idea why I'm here, but um, I, I've tried enough to not be here. And for how many times that did not work, mm -hmm. you know, with it raining and the, the rope literally slipping. So my toes are touching the ground. Um, I, I, for, for getting to this point, it's just like, man, if I can get over that, uh, I, and if, you know, anything else that's in my way now, it's just like, all right, it's, it's no big deal, you know? So it's, it's gotten to the point where, um, at least now, you know, you know, not bringing up past, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just so literal that I, I had to bring that up. Um, uh, I, I, I see life as such an extraordinary opportunity as to just simply grow and just be a little bit better than, than yesterday or be a little bit better tomorrow. Um, and, and, and tapping into who I am and doing that with grace and love and, and passion and sharing that. Hmm. Um, Is that why you reached out to me? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, um, you know, after Peru and I was like, just muddling and figuring out like, what the fuck do I do? <laughs> you know, with like, you know, it, literally admitting to a complete stranger in the middle of the jungle in, in a different country that I made a mistake detransitioning, like, you know, and then having medicine ceremonies that supported that, like, it was just, what do I do? Um, and a, a big thing I did was like, I'm going to uh, objectively, um, you know, listen to other detransition stories and see if anything resonates. And then, if anything did resonate, I'd question everything as to why and dive a little bit deeper and understand my relationship with it. And again, why, <laughs> um, you know, and, um, there was, Oh, what's the YouTube channel? Um, she's a guy that does, um, uh, a bunch of people on in LA. Yeah. Uh, it's a strip. Yeah, I got um, Brian from him. Uh, um, um, be Belly, you got what from him? Uh, one of my guests, one of my detransitioners, was on a show. What, what's his name again? Oh, yeah, the soft white. Yeah, um, underbelly. Soft white underbelly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there was um, there was a detransitioner on there. Um, uh, I forget his name. Um, you know, but his relationship with substances and I mean, his story with child abuse was astronomically not even, you can't even compare it. I mean, what happened to him was beyond tragic and um, there's no comparing. Um, but his, his story, I just completely helped me. I will never forget the date that I watched it. Uh, I, uh, I'll never forget you know, um, understanding my relationship with my reaction to that and, um, you know, and really diving into that. And that was, that was October, uh, 12th, I believe, or 11th, um, 2022. Um, why? And that's, that's when I, what, did, what, what hmm? did it spark in you? Um, his, uh, he, he didn't, he didn't word it exactly, but, um, the, just the, the shaming of, of the masculinity to not hurt someone else. That was, he didn't say that exactly, but that was his overarching message of, as to his, difficult relationship to his masculine or to who he was. Um, and that was, that 
was like a billboard sign hitting my face. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's that, yeah. there's that question. What is a woman? Um, which is kind of a, <laughs> it's a trick question, but, um, what is your relationship to being a man? No. Oh. Man, out of all the questions, that's a toughie. <laughs> um, it, there, it's, it's so funny. There, I mean, for the amount of shame and fear I have, I've worked through on this. Uh, even just by you asking me, I, I can tell I still have more work to do. <laughs> um, but uh, I... I... I see so much of... Um, beauty of being a man in and being strong and being, and I mean, not just physically, but just like spiritually and mentally, just any aspect of being a human um, and not, and focusing on that, not for the betterment of yourself, but those who are around you. Um, whether that be your family, your friends, um, strangers, you know, um, you know, and I, I know that bleeds into that, that certainly can bleed into being a woman as well. But um, it, it, it is com uh, my experience. I, I, I know I never was a real woman, but you know, just with transing and everything, um, and you know, the mindset that I put myself in to to be like a woman, um, that that wasn't there during that time, you know. It was more like, oh, I have a flat tire. Will someone <laughs> come and, you know, stop and help me? You know, mm. now I see an older man have a flat tire and I go stop and change his tire, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and it's not that alone. It's not that single act, yeah. but just having uh, uh, that mental aptitude um, as moving throughout the day. I mean, without the reproductive capacity of a woman, I don't see how a man being a woman is going to tap into that. Um, how do you serve? How do you serve society as a trans woman? I, that's just a question. I'm, I don't mean any judgment to any trans women out there who perhaps are sure. listening in. But uh, how do you serve society as a man? You know, you provide, you build, uh, you fight. Uh, you know, those are those are the pathways that you have or you you add you know through through the arts you add you enlighten you teach a, a woman has those capacities too but also this profound ability to create life that kind of you know causes her to need a lot of facilitation um to do that a trans woman a trans man uh, that's kind of a shadow zone uh, there's no inherent virtue specific to the trans woman um such as has been uh, erected over time for, for men, a masculine virtue. Is there like a trans feminine virtue? You know, can you be motherly? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing out these archetypes. I'm playing with gender. I know that yeah. a certain contingent yeah. of uh, this discourse really bristles whenever I bring up these stereotypes and archetypes, but still, I mean, what do you have to guide you? What ancient wisdom is there for the trans woman? Like when you decide to trans, you, you have, what do you have? You, you have your trauma, you have your, your euphoria, and then you have a bunch of people celebrating you and a huge medical apparatus facilitating this and then a political apparatus enforcing you. But there's no, there's no like Bible for it. There's no like 10 commandments of transing, you know, like there's, there's no, that identity doesn't have, has not yet developed to it. Um, deep virtues in and of itself, such as has been ascribed to males and females over time. So it's just like, you, what else do you have but yourself? Your, yeah, your project. I, uh, you know, um, one of the other big things that came through for me that, um, that I'm, I'm still working on um, is 
understanding that what you just described it um it doesn't it it's the perfect storm to cultivate um i know we throw the word narcissist around a lot however it cultivates narcissistic traits may even cultivate a, a narcissistic person it's possible but because everything is gravitating towards you to serve you in that way to identify in that way it's e even with the most uh, true mirror of yourself uh, of yourself I I mean I, I don't have a true I don't have the truest mirror mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you know I've um, I, I do challenge myself a lot. I, I absolutely question myself. I've questioned myself throughout the entire transition of, is this right for me? Is this okay? Like, you know, I was always like checking in. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when you have all these, um, you know, like, um, like here in Minnesota, uh, it's, it's, it's literally illegal for, um, a therapist to not affirm you right so at no point if if your friend group doesn't affirm you if your therapist doesn't approve you uh doesn't affirm you or uh, and if there, there, there's no uh, family therapist or doctor there's no section of that not affirming you there's no questioning there's no um objective reasoning of is this or is this not right and when, when we get to that degree of those three things happening towards people, for me personally, that 100% created narcissistic traits. I can, I can just indefinitely say that for myself. Um, I, and I think I like to consider myself good hearted uh, and genuine and good intention. Um, but looking back, I am able to just be like, wow, uh, was that serving others or was that serving me? You know, um, and, you know, co coming, coming into relationship with that sort of realization and, um, yeah, just coming into that realization, it was just like, there's, I, I, I find it very hard to believe that this isn't happening to other people. This, uh, yeah, this uh, reality distortion field, this narcissism, Asian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Because it, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, in, in Buddhist teachings, when, when you focus on yourself, you will have suffering. And we have gotten to the point where, where we are encouraging people to focus so much onto themselves. We're, we're saying, yeah, if you have this because you're focusing on yourself and you're suffering, you should, um, you know, uh, you know, trans yourself and have, um, you know, hormones, puberty blockers and, and surgeries. And, th and that'll just fix um, the problem that is just centered around you focusing on yourself too much. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's a, for me, it was a very hard truth, but it was the most absolutely necessary and fair truth that I needed to hear because when, when that, realization came through and I, I worked with it and started living that things started working better in my life than, than they ever have. Um, and, and just, <laughs> it, it, it's what makes me grateful to still be here, you know, to just absolutely have the have that opportunity to realize that uh, I was focused on being self-serving and and flipping that has just been yeah it's just it's just been beautiful. Mm 
<laughs> yeah, that that turn toward grace or the emergence of grace out of out of the chaos that we create for ourselves is. Yes. It's beyond what we deserve. Um, yet it teaches us something yes. about... Some people call it God, some people call it life, but the order of the universe, mm. the, mm -hmm. um, it's like a, like a hint that there is a why. You might not know it and you might break yourself trying I to find it. it, but you know, you can't completely discount that. it, you know? A hint that there's a why. I love it. Huh. Yeah. If there, yeah, it's a pretty strong hint. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, that's loud as, that's a pretty loud as fuck why, or hint, I mean, because, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, for, for how focused I was, you know, I mean, kind of going back to the, the career that I, I thought I wanted, um, you know, with being a bassoonist and everything like that. Um, it it's absolutely incredible to get to the point where um, realizing that I I put all that time into that energy and in, into that you know I was convincing myself that it was it was to help other people and and you know all all these things um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but when I didn't even understand the application of what that career meant, it like going, like going and playing Beethoven and Mozart every weekend and maybe having one concert a year where you're playing different music or, <clears throat> um, teaching students to play, um, those same symphonies or the same concertos perfectly um um uh you know and maybe maybe the top 10 percent will play it in a way will actually like make you cry um i i it's it's really it's the only thing it's it's, it's another one of those things that i i wish i would have realized that it was also just self-serving because I mean, just sitting in a room and playing an instrument is an absolute joy, and it's just beautiful. I, I uh, you know, um, I'm currently in the process of, of selling a professional instrument, and I'll be getting like a, a lower grade model. But you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 and I, I'm not speaking poorly about musicians at all, but. When, when we get to a point where we need to question uh, how, how potent is my impact and how potent is my, is my service doing for others and for, you know, like how good is this actually making me feel? And like, or am I just stressing over um, becoming something or making it or, um, proving myself or like proving something that you, that you would just simply that you're imagining and that you aren't, <clears throat> you know? Um, and that's, that's what really played into the, uh, the, the trans trap as well. <laughs> um, of, of just pretending, uh, to be something that I wasn't. And, um, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of different odd jobs I've done between, you know, um, all the, all the different, you know, different work that I've done, but every single job I realized that, uh, I did that I came home smiling was either, uh, one where I had to do a little sacrifice to myself where not sacrifice, but, you know, be, be of service to others where I was, you know, uh, I, I remember being like a mascot, uh, for my college <laughs> and, uh, they, 
they they liked me at the game so much they ended up bringing me to like other uh like uh, events and and whatnot and i remember them bringing me to like uh it was it was like an autistic uh like festival or like gathering of like a bunch of autistic people and uh you know, it's it's really easy to make those kinds of kids smile and laugh. And I mean, like, it just, I was probably, like, easily, like, one of, like, the happiest days ever. Like, dressing up as a mascot and just making a bunch of, like, you know, autistic kids laugh and, and you know, whatever. You know, and it's just, uh, I don't know. Hmm. Um, because there, there's a huge message right now that's so, um, you know, we must be of service, but you know, we have to like take care of ourselves and we have to like serve ourselves as well. And I think there are a lot of people who are confusing um, self-care with just self-serving yeah. to, to the point where you're not, you're not even uh, a part of society or community. Even if you're surrounding yourself with people that uh, are just constantly self-serving, it's, you're, that's not a community. That's just a, a group of people that it's a collective. It's a collective of, you know, people that are dissociated <laughs> from, you know, from themselves in society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I, I got, uh, I had a, a, a fling with that as well, <laughs> but, um, I was able to understand where, my position was with it a little bit faster than the trans. <laughs> hmm. what, what about the future for you then? No, looking forward. Yeah. The, um, as of right now, I am really enjoying electrician work. I know it's only been a couple of weeks, but, um, I really enjoy the people I work with. I really enjoy the, uh, all the owners of the company, it's, it's like a family owned company. It's not like some big, big thing. Um, and, uh, I really enjoy how they're, how, how they teach. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe becoming an astro electrician, uh, definitely at least journeyman, uh, which would be like a four year process. Um, uh, you know, uh, if I, you know, if the opportunity shows itself, I'd love to have a family. Um, I'd love to um, either, you know, surrogacy or adoption, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think that would be really beautiful. Um, what about being a mentor um, for young men uh, who are who have taken your path, who are trying to off, I guess, derail, detransition. <laughs> I love that derail. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's, um, there, there's certainly a lot of available energy, for, available energy for something like that. Um, I, uh, it's it's such a, a strange thing to market, <laughs> you know. Mm. Like I, it's, well, you're on know, the right channel. Uh, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that that's fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't think of that. Um, yeah, I. Um, you're still processing. It, <sighs> I think more along the lines of I, those types of connections I want. Um, I, if, if it's, if, if there's an interest of, you know, like hearing me, I guess, and, you know, and then there's a reach out, you know, um, for how long I've led a clean life and a healthy life. Um, I'd say I have a, a pretty good outline. <laughs> Uh, to at least, um, you know, getting your compass generally in the right direction, mm -hmm. not necessarily exactly where you want to be, because I think that's a, a false promise. Um, um, 
but yeah, I, I think that would be a really beautiful thing to provide. I think it's a really beautiful service. Um, yeah, I just, uh, uh, I, I didn't, obviously I haven't thought about that much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, what prompted you to reach out to I, me then? Um, my, you know, if, if there's, if there's one person that hears my story and, um, goes off and finds themselves, and yeah. if that means detransitioning or if that means finding themselves within whatever part of their journey that they're on and, that means that they've can lead to a happier life. Then um, that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, you know, because that that was that was the soft white underbelly video for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, especially after hearing how he uh, he killed himself, I was just like, I hmm. uh, <laughs> I have to. Hmm. Um, you know, I, there, <laughs> I, I don't hear enough men that have walked, um, the, the D-trans, um, path that speak in a way of, of truth, honest and vulnerability and love and, and strength and power at the same time. Um, strength and power, just, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually. It just um, not like money and influence or anything like that. Um, it just. Like a detrans Tate. That's not know. what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> just to be clear. Oh, fuck. That's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to be laughing about that all month. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's just, yeah. I uh, encouraging people to, to follow the path of truth. And um, I know that can be con- easily construed and manipulated into a lot of different ways. Um, but you know, yeah. when I'm, when I'm at the point now, I can honestly say I'm, I'm on that path and, um, Mm. damn, does it feel good? Yeah. And, um, it's, yeah, it's like walking is like flying as if I'm like a bald eagle, man. (laughs) It's, it's just, it's amazing. It's the most freeing thing I have ever done. Oh, great. No, you sound you sound like you're in a light position. You sound full of levity <laughs> for such a weighted experience. Is there is there any place <laughs> for people that reach out to you? Or are you gonna be off the grid? They can contact me or Yeah, they can contact you. Um uh I'm on Instagram. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dot Kevin underscore Jones. Right. Then I'll put that. I'll put that there. So any any young men, especially, yeah. or maybe even parents of young men, um, they can reach out to you if they feel so prompted. Yeah, I, I guess now that you mentioned that, there's um, there's three set of parents that um, I'm not like. I, I just have like monthly or bi-weekly conversations with them mm-hmm. about their their child that are um mm-hmm. of what they're going through and um you know the sort of space i'm holding for that is just allowing them to ask me anything and everything <laughs> and i just give honest feedback um and i don't know um i i can't imagine of being the position that those parents are in and uh i i don't know i i I guess if enough started reaching out i would need to somehow manage my time and um 
maybe maybe start charging for it but i just i for the capacity i have right now yeah. it's just not it's not something i would i could charge for hmm. um but uh that that's that's been something i'm i've been more familiar with um i've had i've had some folks try to uh have me directly talk to their children and i I don't know, just because they're minors and I'm not like a licensed professional, it just like, you know, even if they're present, I just, um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not trained. <laughs> like I'm just a scumbag without a bag, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I did, I did it. Um, you know, I did an in-person meeting with, with a minor, with parents present, and uh, I met with them a couple of times. And after that, I was just like, I, I'm not suited for this. Okay. <laughs> to to speak directly to yeah. to youngins, like at least like in that sort of capacity, you know. Yeah. Um, I just uh, I, I I don't know. Maybe I am, and I'm being super hypercritical, but um, uh. I, you know, uh, the whole adage of, um, you know, you, you, you give a, a, a guy a fish uh, without teaching him to, to learn how to fish, you know, um, cause there's so much beauty in failure. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, hmm. um, yeah. Talking somebody if, down from with, a cliff um, that they might <clears throat> be jumping off of anyways. Right. Right. You know, um, not to be fatalistic. But... Yeah. No, I, well, I mean, I, I'm a pretty thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to a tried and true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it gets, it gets to the point where, um, Oh man, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, let's wrap up the episode. Amazing. Yeah, no, amazing. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much for, for <laughs> uh, thank you very much for reaching out and uh, being so candid uh, with your story. And um, of course, oh, in the description, I'll link anything else that uh, any sort of connection or contact info that, that you want to provide. But um, sure. just to wrap up, what was a, what was, Pleasure. what was a piece of wisdom or, or, or book or, or person that, that really helped you most in, in all these various transitions in your life, something that was, or maybe even just an internal sense of guidance that you've had. If you can find someone that, is a true mirror for yourself, not for someone that's projecting their own crap onto you. You know, I've, um, that's, that's, that's huge for finding help because when we find help and sometimes there's helpful hands and, you know, helpful, uh, helpful people, uh, you know, and they just end up, you know, like, oh, you must have, you know, complex, you know, PTSD or something like that, you know, and then they go down that rabbit hole or something like that. And they don't focus on what you're actually saying, <laughs> you know, not that that was a personal experience of mine or anything mm -hmm. like that <laughs> after a 30 minute session with someone, um, uh, you know, so, I, um, for really understanding that when you're talking to someone that's helping you and they aren't mirroring what you're saying, so then you can understand it in your own way that feels good for you and that moves for your compass. I mean, not to affirm you, <laughs> but um, but to mirror you in a way that's unbiased and, and true. Um, hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's... That's that's also to leg up. Oh, huge, 
I, the, the, the connections I have of people that I can send voice messages to, to just texts or call or even therapists. It's massive. It's so critical because it, those are the types of people that are, that will actually get you unstuck because if they aren't, um, if they're just, um, projecting their own stuff on you, you will stay stuck and add on top of what that person is saying to you. Mm. You know, like it, it, you're not going to get anywhere. And I've, I've had a lot of therapists where that's happened, but I thought it was something I did. And I was like, why didn't I ever get anywhere? Like, I don't understand. Like, what did I do wrong? Like I was, I was up, open, honest, vulnerable, like all the things and nothing happened. What, what the hell? Uh, mm. You know, and um, and it wasn't until someone said, like, my mission is to be a mirror for the people I'm with and to help them. I'm like, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> that 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 makes sense because you're really smart and really wise and super helpful. And uh, when it comes down to when I was working with that person, it was just like. Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, you know, you're just. Um, you know, I, like one of the, one of the, the best questions that helped me a lot, that's universal when we're trying to figure something out as to, you know, like if we're, if I'm on the right path or if I'm making the right decision, um, if you had, the question is for that, if you had to make your best worst guess as to blank for should I do this? Or why do I feel that way? Or um, why am I triggered by this? That opens, that lowers the your, your ego, your mask of yourself to the point where then you can actually authentically be honest with yourself. So you're being your own therapist in that sense. But it's also a really helpful tool when you're talking to people that are supposed to be helping you also ask that because it pulls that sense of true sense from you and you, you get you find out some really interesting things when you make your best worst guess mm. because it's actually your authentic self mm. right there mm -hmm. <laughs> you just take a stab in the dark absolutely yeah. absolutely and when we're making our, that that stab in the dark it's it's unbiased and it's unfiltered and um it's usually very honest mm. <laughs> Very honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, thanks for being so honest, Kevin. Doing my best.